Hi, everyone. Um, thanks very much for tuning in to listen to this recorded session. Um, I may know some of you, but my name's Kelly Victor. I'm a consultant clinical scientist based at Cleveland Clinic in London. And today we're going to be talking about the echocardiographic assessment of aortic regurgitation. I'm joined today by Dr. Becky Hahn, who's joining us from Columbia. Becky, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm Becky Hahn. I'm an interventional echocardiographer specializing in valvular heart disease. I'm here at uh, Columbia University in New York um, and very happy to be discussing these new uh, practical guidelines that have been generated um, by the British Society of Echocardiography. So I think we'll, we'll start with some questions and I wanted to address the first question to Kelly, which is uh, why were the guidelines released? Well, I guess, you know, for any style of echo, we always need to have certain criteria that we're trying to look towards. And that's not uh, specific to aortic regurgitation. But one of the things that we did notice was that our previous BSE aortic regurgitation guidelines were published right back in 2012. So that's over 10 years ago. And we just felt as though with the new evidence, the new data, all the changes that we're having in echocardiography, that the, the users, our membership, really deserved up-to-date guidance. And so that's what we've done. That's excellent. You know, the other thing that the, the timing of the release to me was uh, has been perfect because we're now uh, reaching a stage where we've, we're starting to look more at aortic regurgitation, um, particularly given uh, the new, there are two new uh, transcatheter devices that are out there that could treat some of these patients that may be very high risk. So I think the timing of the publication is, is absolutely perfect and really needed um, in, in, in our field. Um, could I ask you what what was covered in the guideline? What what uh, did you choose to to include? So um, the guideline it starts off. Um, I, I guess to talk about our approach first of all. So it's a very practical, a very systematic approach. We want this document to be user friendly. So it's very much a step by step guide, uh, and it's focusing on how can we actually have a comprehensive assessment of aortic regurgitation. Um, but more than that, what it does is it, it provides support for the interpreting echocardiographer in some of the challenges and the knock-on effect of those challenges. So how do we actually in interpret aortic regurgitation and its severity in the setting of those challenges? How can we make sure that our grading of the aortic regurgitation severity is correct? Once we do that, we also talk a little bit about uh, other cardiac imaging modalities, so a little bit about CMR and also CT, because that's quite vital, particularly in those discrepant cases. And then we talk a little bit about aortic regurgitation in the clinical context. So there's a significant difference between chronic versus acute aortic regurgitation, and that's addressed. But we also talk a little bit about what to look for in terms of prompting referral for intervention and the, the consequences of combined valve disease, so AS and AR or MR and AR. So overall, it's quite a comprehensive document, but we have tried to keep it very practical. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I just love how each of the different sec, uh, sections of, of uh, you know, use of various parameters um, is preceded by the key points so that you have kind of in a nutshell for uh, the echocardiographer, the practicing echocardiographer, um, you know, the, the things that we want to look at, but also the limitations perhaps of that particular parameter. And, and that's what I think makes it such a, a powerful document. You discuss all the strengths and weaknesses of these parameters and, and, and don't just discuss, uh, you know, how to, how to do it, um, but when to use it. And that's really, I think, uh, very, very helpful. What do you think the guidelines mean now for, for clinical practice? Well, I think that um, once upon a time, echocardiographers were very much, you know, image takers, and we were using uh, specific measurements to look at 
AR, but I think what this does in terms of clinical practice is it gives us a little bit more of a holistic um, approach to the assessment of aortic regurgitation. So it looks at those uh, qualitative, semi-quantitative, quantitative parameters, but it also gets the echocardiographer thinking about the corroborative uh, aspects. So thinking about LV volumes, thinking about strain, reversal within the descending aorta and the, and the arch. Um, and then it also thinks about how is this fitting in terms of management of the patient, so for a moderate lesion versus severe. And if there's any discrepancies, how do we tease out how much AR there is? If I can just share an algorithm with you, this is something I'm quite excited about. So this is going to be in the new guidance. And um, just to be clear, this addresses chronic aortic regurgitation. As mentioned, acute AR is addressed separately within the guidance. Um, and if I can just share this for one second. Okay, so in this algorithm here, what you can see, if we start on the left-hand side, is this is where... Uh, aortic regurgitation is visually mild or less. What we want to try and do in this time of you know, um, large waiting lists for patients, we want to use our time effectively. So what we're, we're targeting here is getting echocardiographers to look at a range of assessments and where they think that that AR is mild or less we can stop at that point. We don't need to go on to perform quantitative assessments because there's not that much value in doing that. Uh, so you can see those parameters highlighted here in the green box. Then what we do is we're using quantitative and also corroborative findings where they're most needed. And that's really teasing out moderate versus severe AR. And here you can see that we're drawing on jet width over LVOT diameter ratio, vena contractor, and also EROA. Then we're looking at those findings in relation to reversal. And then we're looking at left ventricular findings. I think it's we, we can't put enough importance on that. As we develop as echocardiographers, it's much more than just taking the echo measurements. It's thinking about the whole, the whole picture um, and the heart, you know, the knock-on effects of those lesions. We also need to consider when um, transthoracic echo is not enough. Um, so can we use it as a complement with TOE or do we need to also think about other imaging modalities? And then lastly, you can see within the algorithm, whether we go down the, the yellow route or the red, we have recommendations at the bottom, and that's for follow-up. So moderate lesions might be seen every 12 to 14 months. Obviously, for severe, we need to think about other aspects. Uh, what's the cause? We need to be thinking about the knock-on effects. We need to be uh, flagging this up as a patient that will be requiring clinical review and possibly intervention. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I love the algorithm. I think it'll be very helpful for clinical practice. Um, I think the guidelines also um, mention some gaps in our knowledge. For instance, one of them um, is uh, the stress testing. Um, and I think that uh, for some of the other valvular heart diseases, we actually can quantify um, the the changes in, in regurgitation or the change in uh, gradients across a, a stenotic aortic valve, for instance, um, using using stress testing. But but what is what is the issue with uh, aortic regurgitation? So in that setting, what we're really doing is we're um, looking at changes in the length of diastole. And because we're doing that and we're looking at that at a changing heart rate, we can't as we can't be as confident with the findings of a stress echo. What we can do is we can use any type of exercise testing to help us in the assessment of symptoms and also the response of the left ventricle. So how much does the left ventricular systolic function improve with exercise? 
Excellent. Um, yeah, I think I think it's everything is covered. Uh, you know, all the the strengths and weaknesses again of each of the measurements. But more than that, you've really given us a, a step by step guide as to how to actually perform those measurements. And I think that that is a real strength of this particular guideline uh, versus uh, uh, some of the other guidelines that uh, societal guidelines that are perhaps a little bit more general and have to cover all the all, all the different uh, valvular regurgitant lesions. So to, to isolate aortic regurgitation in this way, I think, is, is just a really perfect way of, of, of educating clinicians and echocardiographers. Oh, and Becky, if I may ask you a question, um, the, the, the guidance that we're providing in this one is very much um, as we would see it in the UK, and it does align with recommendations for clinical indications and also triaging with some of our society, say heart valve disease and um, the British Cardiac Society. H how does it align in relation to other international guidelines? I think it aligns perfectly. Um, I think that uh, every single parameter that, that is, that's discussed uh, re really is in agreement with other uh, international societal guidelines. Um, but again, as, as, I, as I mentioned, it's just beautifully illustrated in this particular guideline and with real step-by-step -step, um, uh, instruction on, on, on how to actually acquire the quantitation needed or the, ver the, the uh, parameter that, that's being discussed. And then also discusses very in great detail um, the pitfalls of many of these of these parameters, which then allows, I think, the clinician to understand how integrative they must be uh, when they're looking at aortic regurgitation, which which I think is an important aspect of this particular disease, which uh, I think we've really kind of underestimated uh, for some time now. But it, but by using multiple parameters and integrating those parameters, I think we have a a much better chance at uh, detecting significant disease and moving our patients appropriately on to intervention. I 100% agree. And I think that for me, aortic regurgitation is actually one of the hardest valve lesions to assess in terms of severity. So hopefully our membership will be able to use this guidance to improve patient care. I think one of the... Um, one of the challenges that some of our membership might have is accessibility to 3D and also to strain. So uh, we've had a couple of guidelines more recently that do encourage the use of strain and 3D. Uh, we would just continue to encourage those who, who don't have the skills to, uh, to attend courses, to get the education, to try and convince some of their um, workplaces to get the technology where that's a limitation. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I do think that uh, three-dimensional imaging of the vena contracta and even being able to integrate the vena contracta over the, the, over the diastolic time interval uh, will really help us be more precise about uh, quantitation but, and, and be a confirming quantitative metric that we can use in addition to proximal ice velocity surface area and the volumetric Doppler uh, that is so well described in the document. Document. Um, and in addition, there is, a, as you say, a, a growing body of literature uh, regarding global longitudinal strain and its impact on outcomes. And so uh, I think particularly given the automation that the AI being used now to, to give us those measures and, and how robust some of the, the AI um, algorithms are, I think that it is important, uh, as you say also, that strain become part of of our practice and that we actually are uh, using it on a day-to-day -day basis in order to get used to, to quantifying and adjusting if we need to the, the, uh, the AI algorithm um, and then being able to really follow the literature about outcomes, which we now believe um, are quite uh, important uh, using strain. Lovely. I think, um, you know, one of the highlights for me in working on this guideline was just being able to pull together all different people from all different backgrounds and areas and regions, and particularly you, Becky, having an international representative. It was just, it's so refreshing to see the alignment between different places. So I just wanted to say thank you very much for your help with the guideline. 
Um, and you, to the membership, we hope that you find this useful, whether you're a very experienced echocardiographer, a, a clinician, an interventional cardiologist. You know, we hope that this really helps to improve diagnosis uh, and outcomes for our patients.